Hello everyone! Before you begin this vodcast, make sure that you have downloaded the guided notes that go with it from our website on Edmodo. All of these topics that you are about to see come from your summer assignment packet in the subject area that says stuff that you should know. So let's go ahead and start going through that list one by one. And as you go through it, keep your guided notes out so that you can answer questions as we go. So before we, we begin, one of the things that I always like to do is to provide for students some cool applications that they could use on their iPhone, iTouch, or Android. So um, here are some of my favorite programs that I've used in the past. ChemPro Lite, um, it has these small little lessons that you can um, receive for free. And if you purchase the full version, you get more and more topics. So um, take a look at it, see what you think, and um, uh, you could always um, provide some feedback maybe on our website to those who are interested in maybe purchasing that program. Um, the next program that I have is the Chem App Lite. This is a game. It's kind of cool. Um, it helps you get better at naming and identifying compounds by their formula. So if you struggle with uh, formula writing or identifying names, this might be a good application for you, and it's free. The next one on the list is TCT Lite. It is a free periodic table. It has atomic weight, electronegativity values, atomic size. Um, that'll be a great program, and I plan on using that on my phone uh, frequently, and I have in the past. So um, I strongly recommend that particular program. Uh, the next one is the Chem Calculator. It's great for calculating molar mass, but I caution you not to get too comfortable using this application like every time that you have to do molar mass because on tests and quizzes and especially on the AP exam you'll be expected to have to calculate those molar masses by yourself. Uh, but it is handy for when you want just a little bit um, to save a little time on your homework. So I have no problem with you guys using that in class. Uh, the next one here on the list is Power One SL. Um, I like this particular one. It is a um, pretty handy dandy scientific calculator. They have two different versions. One of them is free and uh, the other one you have to pay a little bit more and then it turns into a graphing calculator and it's pretty good. Um, I've used both versions and I decided that um, the graphing wasn't necessarily what I needed, uh, wasn't super uh, easy to use, but the regular scientific calculator is super handy. So just a few applications, and if you th can think of any more, please feel free to go ahead and post them on our website, and um, I'll check them out, and obviously everyone else will too. So on this slide, we'll begin with talking about atomic structure. This should be a review. So I found this picture off of the internet and decided to just kind of borrow this one. Um, really good, just kind of basic information that you should remember. The atomic number is also equal to the number of protons that are located inside of the nucleus. And remember, protons are positive. Uh, the mass number is typically a whole number that represents the number of protons plus neutrons added together. So if you're given the mass number and the atomic number, you could figure out the number of neutrons by just simply subtracting. Um, electrons, if you have a neutral atom with no charge, the atomic number will also equal the number of electrons because atoms are neutral. But as soon as the atom turns into an ion, an ion with either a positive or negative charge, well, then the number of electrons can change. So if an atom has a plus one charge, that means that that particular atom has lost electrons. Remember, electrons are negative, so if you lose something that has a negative charge, that would mean that it has more protons than electrons, giving it a positive charge. Another thing to remember is that the mass of an electron is extremely small. Um, it takes 1,840 electrons to equal the mass of one proton. So when we talk about atomic mass, or the mass number, you'll notice that electrons are not included in the formula for calculating the mass number. That's because electrons have virtually uh, no mass compared to protons or neutrons. All right, ions and isotopes. Atoms can gain or lose electrons, and that's how we make ionic compounds. And when they do, they either become positive or negatively charged. So this is just kind of a little review. Cations are positive, anions are negative. Cations are positive, as I explained before, because they lost electrons. Anions are negative because they gained negatively charged electrons. 
So each element in the periodic table can have a different number of neutrons inside of the nucleus. So when I talk about hydrogen, there's actually three different types of hydrogen. There's protium, deuterium, and tritium. Protium has one proton, zero neutrons. Deuterium, another form of hydrogen, can have one proton and one neutron. You hear the word do or do. That is the French word for two. Um, tritium, you hear the word tri or trit in the front, and that kind of represents the number three. Uh, tritium is another form of hydrogen that again has one proton, but this time we'll have two neutrons. They're all hydrogen. The only difference is that they all have a different number of neutrons, which changes its mass number. So I put a couple links on this particular um, uh, slide, and I hope that this gets into your vodcast. Okay, this website comes from chemforkids.com. Handy little resource. Um, a little bit more on the basic side. Doesn't really go into very much AP chemistry topics. But it might be helpful for some of you who uh, maybe just want a quick review of um, everything dealing with the basics of chemistry. It talks about how atoms make ions. Um, it also talks about um, electrovalence, kind of a silly word for just electronegativity, or the greediness for an atom to gain electrons. Um, the differences between covalent and ionic bonds. And um, if you want to keep going, just click on here and it'll keep going to the next topic, which is um, about neutrons, mass number, isotopes, which is great. Do you remember how to calculate average atomic mass right here? Um, great review for those of you who would like to see that. Um, anyway, it keeps going and if you look back over on the right hand side over here, these are all the topics that chem for kids um, goes over. So I'm going to go back to our PowerPoint. The next website on this um, slide will take you to probably one of my favorite websites that will help you out in AP Chemistry. So I would highly recommend that maybe you um, bookmark this particular website. Look at all of these topics over on the left hand side. Um, as we proceed through AP Chemistry, this particular website comes great in handy from pretty much right here all the way down. Um, solution chemistry, thermodynamics, um, kinetics, equilibrium, acid base, oxidation reduction, these are all of your topics right here. So um, I highly recommend that you check this particular website out. But uh, here's the basics of the atomic structure. Make sure that you click on this little button right here that says next so that you proceed through the topic. This is a great review for those of you who um, would like to use this. So definitely bookmark this for later. Totally love that particular website. All right, let's keep going. Um, this is one of the topics that I would expect you guys to have memorized at this point is how to predict the charge of ions when they come off of the periodic table just by looking at their position on the periodic table. So starting over on the left hand side, this is the very first group on the periodic table. These are called alkali metals, um, except for hydrogen. Hydrogen is not an alkali metal, but it's placed on the same group because every one of these guys have the same number of valence electrons, and if you look up at the very top, they all have a plus one ionic charge when they lose electrons because it's a plus one charge. It's a cation. The next group over right here, these are the alkaline earth metals. All alkaline earth metals have a positive two charge and they all have two valence electrons. Come over to the right hand side of the periodic table. You'll notice that I skipped a big block of elements here and down here when I jumped from positive two all the way over to the boron group. That's because these guys in the middle and down below, they are transition metals. Transition metals are unique in the fact that they can have multiple charges. So I don't require you guys to memorize the charges of transition or inner transition metals. So don't worry about those because they can have multiple charges. There's a few exceptions. There's um, a little area of stability kind of right around this area. Nickel will always have a positive two charge. 
silver right here will always have a positive one charge and zinc right over here can always have a positive two charge. So it's kind of like this little three element area that can always be um, the same charge and you won't have to worry about those changing on you. All right, um, back up over here. You'll notice that boron is not highlighted in this positive three area. That's because boron has some unique characteristics. It can actually have um, a few different charges. So when you're looking at this positive three charge, I want you to know that that only belongs to aluminum. Aluminum is the metal. All these other guys in here are either um, uh, metalloids. So boron is technically a uh, metalloid. Um, so he can have multiple charges and we'll get into all of that later. So don't worry about the carbon group because if you look at the position of carbon, carbon can either gain four electrons and be like neon, or he can lose two electrons and be like helium. So this entire group is either four positive or four negative. So we're going to ignore that group for now and obviously we'll get back to that again later. The next group over is the nitrogen group. The nitrogen group here has a negative three charge and we're only including nitrogen and phosphorus. After that you start getting into uh, metalloids and transition metals with bismuth down here on the end. Uh, the next group over, oxygen. The oxygen group, um, the ones only the ones highlighted are the ones that you need to memorize. These um, have a negative two charge. That means that they're gaining two electrons. And the last group over here is the halogens and they all have a negative one charge and only the ones that are highlighted this guy right here acetine he is a metalloid has some characteristics of metals and nonmetals so um, only the ones that you see highlighted are the ones you have to memorize and then don't forget that the noble gases at the very end they don't have a charge that's because they're incredibly stable they have full valence electrons on their outermost ring so they're incredibly stable all right, at this point, you need to check your knowledge and look at your guided notes that I provided for you. Please make sure that you answer the questions from section one at this time. Section two deals with naming ionic compounds. So let's just have a quick review of this. The cation is always written first in an ionic formula and they are always monatomic, that means single atom, metal, and they're always a metal, except for ammonium, and hydronium. So the ammonium ion looks like this. NH4 and this guy has a positive one charge. So it's one nitrogen, four hydrogens working as a group. This whole thing works as a group to have a positive one charge. Hydronium, that is a special ion that you will encounter when we start talking about acids. And the formula of the hydronium ion is H3O with a positive one charge. So as you can see, both of these cations, they don't have any metals in them. Nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, those are all non-metals. But they work together as a group to have a positive charge. Most other um, cations are metals. In fact, every other cation that you will encounter in an ionic compound will be just a single atom sitting there, um, kind of like, say, for example, copper. Copper with a positive two charge is probably the most common form of copper. And you see how it's just one atom with a positive two charge. We call those monatomic or single atom ions. All right. Now, a couple of things to remember. If the metal is from group one or two, also including aluminum, remember we talked about that in the previous side, um, silver, gold, and nickel are also included. Uh, it's just their name that you just write out. You don't have to worry about um, something else that comes next when you have metals that come from the transition metal area. So either the uh, middle block or the block below is what I'm talking about. Um, those metals can have multiple charges. For example, I told you that copper 2 plus was probably the most common form of copper, but there is um, another type of copper, for example, Cu with a positive three charge. So how can we differentiate between these two ions? Both of them are copper. One of them has a positive two. One of them has a positive three. 
Well, if you wanted to name this particular ion, you would have to use Roman numerals after the name copper. So I would call this the copper 2 cation. Uh, this one I would call the copper 3 cation. And so you use Roman numerals to indicate transition metals that can have multiple charges so that people know which one you're talking about. Anions always come second in the ionic formula and are always nonmetals, always, no exceptions. So if the nonmetal is monatomic, that remember means single atom, then all you have to do is add an ide to the end of its name. So if you want to talk about sulfur, the sulfur ion has a negative two charge. We would just call this, instead of saying sulfur, we would say sulfide, and it's monatomic. All right. But when you start working with polyatomic anions, well, then its name is going to come from a list. And it just so happens that I have a wonderful list for you to check out. This list of polyatomic ions um, comes from this particular website that I have put into your PowerPoint. I'll show it when you I'll show it to you when we go back to the PowerPoint. But this particular website has a pretty thorough list of polyatomic ions. You're more than welcome to use this frequently. I would probably bookmark this if I were you. I think it's one of the most thorough ones that I've seen. There are many different lists. So um, this particular one, though, has all the basics. All right, some examples of ionic compounds would be uh, CAS. Notice that calcium comes first, and calcium is a metal. Um, the S comes second, and that is the anion and it's monatomic. There's only one single S sitting there. So we're going to call this S an, um, sulfide. And so the name of the compound becomes calcium sulfide. You always put the name of the metal first, the name of the nonmetal second. This next example has iron and oxygen. But you'll notice that iron, if you check your periodic table, comes from the transition metal block. So this iron can have multiple charges. In order to figure out which one it is, that's when we're going to look at the anion, the oxygen. All right, oxygen, we know its charge. Oxygen always has a negative 2 charge. Well, notice that in this formula, you only had it paired up with one iron. So if this guy right here is negative 2, that means that this iron must have a positive 2. Because when you put metals and nonmetals together, they have to balance out their net charge to be 0. In other words, the number of electrons lost has to equal the number of electrons gained. So in this particular example, this iron would have a positive 2 charge. So do you remember what to do? You put the Roman numeral 2 inside of the parentheses after the name of the metal. So the name of this compound is iron 2 oxide. Here's a couple more examples with the, those uh, polyatomic ions. So let's see if we can try to name these. Magnesium, that was the name of this particular metal. But in parentheses, we see this group. NO2. And then on the outside of the parentheses, we see that we had to use two of these um, ions in order to balance the formula. Alrighty, well, magnesium is easy. We just have to look up what this NO2 is. So you're going to have to go to the internet to grab the name of NO2. Here's NO2. It has a negative one charge, and its name is nitrite. So the compound's name is simply magnesium nitrite. This next example, in the front, there's your metal, Al, that's aluminum. But then you've got this huge thing attached, ASO4. All right, so we need the name of ASO4. So you go to your list, and here is ASO4. It has a negative 3 charge. It is called arson 8. Please do be mindful of the ending, because there's one right above that says arsenite. So we had ASO4, not ASO3. Therefore, the name of this compound is aluminum arson 8. All right. Ionic compounds always have a net charge of 0. This is just kind of a review. In other words, the number of electrons gained must be equal to the number of electrons lost. Here's a short 4-minute tutorial to help you. Please feel free to download this. Here's how to write chemical formulas by being given the name of the substance. First of all, when you're given the name of the substance, you need to look up the symbol and charge of the ions in question. Sodium is Na. Chloride is Cl. Sodium has a plus one ion charge. Chloride has a negative one ion charge. 
Therefore, they cancel each other out. NaCl. Iron is Fe. Now, you don't need to look up the charge of iron here because this is iron 2, which means the charge of the iron is plus 2. Nitride comes from nitrogen, which is N. N has a minus 3 ion charge. 2 times 3 is 6. I need 3 of these and 2 of these. Fe3N2 is the formula. Ammonium. Ammonium has a formula of NH4. Sulfate. Sulfate is SO4 with a charge of minus 2. It takes two plus ones to cancel out a minus 2. NH2, SO4. Lead is PB. Again, we don't need to look up its charge because the Roman numeral tells us its charge. 4 plus 4. Nitrite is NO2 minus 1. It takes 4 minus 1s to cancel out a plus 4. PbNO2, 4. Magnesium is Mg. Magnesium has a plus 2 ion charge. Oxide is oxygen. Oxide has a minus 2 ion charge. Plus 2 and minus 2 cancel each other out. Manganese is Mn. Because the Roman numeral 6 is given here, that's the ion charge of the manganese. Sulfide comes from sulfur, which is S. Sulfide has a minus 2 ion charge. It takes 3 minus 2s to make minus 6, which cancels out the plus 6. Manganese 6 sulfide. Lithium is Li. Lithium. Okay, guys, you get the point. I want you to check yourself and make sure that you answer all the questions from section two of your guided notes. Section three and four go pretty quick. Um, they're a topic that most of you guys are familiar with, so let's go ahead and start with balancing reactions. Um, first of all, just make sure that you know what the law of conservation of mass says, that in any chemical reaction, uh, the number of atoms and its mass all, um, has to be the same on both sides of the reaction, on the reactants and the products. So um, I always like to show my students just a few pointers for tackling some of the harder reactions that they may encounter in AB chemistry. So uh, here we go. Let me show you what I got. So here's a typical organic um, compound, CH4, um, that is being combusted. And you can tell that it's a combustion reaction because you end with CO2 and H2O in the products, and you are adding a hydrocarbon to oxygen on the reactant side. So one of the best techniques that I like to use is uh, draw a line down from the arrow that separates the reactants from the products, and then count up the number of atoms on both sides of the line. Try to keep the atoms in the same order. So on the left, if you put them in the order of carbon, hydrogen, and then oxygen, on the right side, make sure you do the same thing. Okay. Keep in mind all the subscripts and everything, and sometimes you might have parentheses, so watch out for those too. Be very careful. Counting atoms may seem like an easy task, but it can easily um, be the number one source of error when you're trying to balance a chemical reaction. It's not counting your atoms correctly. All right, here is the biggest tip for, um, for this particular reaction, and in particular combustion reactions. So um, balance the atom that occurs the most often last. So in this particular chemical reaction, I see carbon here. I'm not going to count like how many there are. I'm just going to see how many times I see it occurring in the chemical reaction. So I see carbon one time, two times. I see hydrogen here and here. So hydrogen occurs twice. But look how many times we encounter oxygen. Um, I see oxygen one, two, three times in three different chemicals. So whichever atom occurs the most often, oxygen in this case, you want to balance that guy last. So in order to balance, we use something called coefficients. Coefficients are the big numbers that you place in front of a chemical formula in order to try to balance it. So in this particular case, we decided that we wanted to balance oxygen last. So I balanced everything but oxygen. Notice I put a coefficient of 2 in front of water on the product side. And so that gave me a count of 4 hydrogens. You still have 1 carbon. And if you count carefully, you've got 2 oxygen here and you have two more oxygen, so actually this number is not correct. 
Uh, that should be what, guys? Two here, two here. Sorry, that should be a four right there. My bad. Anyway, um, so we have everything balanced. The carbon, the hydrogen, but now the hardest element, oxygen, is just not balancing out. There's no real way, good way to do it. All right, well, anytime you encounter a problem like that, all you have to do is add a coefficient to the hydrocarbon. The hydrocarbon is the um, element in the front right here that has carbon and hydrogen. That's why we call it a hydrocarbon. And we're going to double all the other coefficients that we already placed. So that's going to increase um, the carbon and hydrogen to 2 and 8. So you'll notice that I placed a 2 here and I placed a 4 there to make that hydrogen 8. And then when you recalculate, you now have 8 oxygens over on the right side. So that's a pretty easy way to fix your oxygen problem, right? So what coefficient would you guys like to place in front of that oxygen over on the left side? A 4. All right, well now, the way that I balance this, I want you to notice that this happens to many students. Um, what they'll do is they'll see 2, 4, 2, 4, and they won't think in their head to reduce that. So 2, 4, 2, 4 can actually reduce to 1, 2, 1, 2. So anytime you encounter a problem where you're trying to balance, you're trying to balance, and when you finally do balance it, you get all these coefficients that can actually be reduced, make sure you do so. All right, here's um, another uh, example of polyatomic ions. When you're trying to balance polyatomic ions and you see them occurring on both sides of the chemical reaction and they haven't changed, man, instead of counting individual atoms, why don't you count the polyatomic ions, how many polyatomic ions there are on both sides. So um, this didn't show up very well. Hold on, I'm going to fix that right now. There, that's better. So over on the left side, you have two irons, and you see the three on the outside of the parentheses, so you technically have three sulfates. You have one barium, and you see the parentheses with the two here, so you've got two hydroxides. Over here, one barium, one sulfate, one iron, and three hydroxides. You see the parentheses there. So it makes it much more easier to balance. So instead of trying to balance the individual atoms, which would take you a pretty lengthy amount of time here, uh, just balance the, the polyatomic ions. Really nifty trick. So that makes it really easy. Um, you'll notice over on the left we have two irons. Check on the right. Yep, two irons. Um, here you have three sulfates. Check over here. That coefficient means you've got three sulfates. Here you have three bariums. There's three bariums. And three and two, that means you have six hydroxides. All right, so three, two. You have six hydroxides here, too. So hopefully those couple tips will help you out throughout the year. Um, here is your section three questions. Make sure you go back right now at this time and answer those questions from section three before you move on. All right, here is the last section of part one of your vodcast. This all reviews the different types of chemical reactions. So um, there are five main types, and actually there's six, but you're not going to learn the sixth one until much later in the year. Um, but, ooh, numbering got messed up. But uh, the five main types are synthesis, decomposition, single replacement, double replacement, and my favorite, the combustion. The combustion reaction is where you um, see that word hydrocarbon. just means that you have something that has carbon and hydrogen, but sometimes it can also have oxygen. It's basically just any organic compound. And what you're doing is you're burning it in the presence of oxygen. And when you do that, and uh, assuming it's complete combustion, sometimes there are incomplete combustions. All right, the other chemical reactions that you have, um, here are kind of like little examples that I gave you to try to remember what's going on. Synthesis means you're bringing them together. Decomposition, you're breaking them apart. A single replacement will always have a single atom trying to cut in on a compound. And this single atom or single element sitting right here can either be a metal or a non-metal. And to make sure that this reaction goes, you're going to have to check something called the metal reactivity series to see if this reaction will proceed or not. And there is also a non-metal reactivity list. And that one um, is provided on the internet, but once I talk to you about some of the trends on the periodic table, you won't need that list anymore. 
So we'll, we'll dive into this a little bit more, but for now, just understand what a single replacement is. And um, here you have a double replacement reaction. Two compounds make two compounds. Pretty simple. Um, not going to go into too much detail. However, when we start doing double replacement reactions, we obviously start talking about solubility rules. And so here we go. Uh, this image right here, um, this is the one that I found off of the internet. This is the one I use for AP Chemistry all the time. Uh, you will get a copy of this eventually, but if you want to, you can just copy the picture off of my PowerPoint because I provided that for you off of Edmodo. Anyway, um, if something is called soluble, that means that we put the symbol AQ next to it. If something is insoluble, that means we put the symbol S or solid next to it because it can't dissolve in water. So um, please make sure that you understand that the top half is soluble and the bottom half is insoluble. And remember that there are always exceptions to every rule. So make sure that you try to memorize some of the exceptions. Here are your section four questions to make sure that you um, understood the material. Please make sure that you also do these right here for the solubility rules. And guys, that's it. You made it to the end of your very first vodcast. Congratulations. The next vodcast will be posted in maybe about a week or two. Until then, enjoy your summer, guys. Talk to you later.